of the, the previous first slide. Oh. Can I start? No, no. First slide, you know. First slide. First slide. So good morning to all of you. Uh, I uh, would uh, I am continuing my lecture on the tissues of the body, and today will be part two of the lecture. If you remember from my uh, previous lecture. Uh, I had uh, covered a, uh, a bit of the uh, nervous system, introduction to the nervous system, uh, but I could not complete it. Uh, I would like to mention here that uh, uh, there are several classes on the nervous system later on uh, in your curriculum. Uh, so I will just uh, uh, start with a system which I would like to cover in uh, more detail. So the, the, the tissue which I would like to cover today is the muscular tissue. And uh, uh, you probably know that uh, the muscles comprise approximately 40 to 50 percent of our body weight. Uh, but it may vary depending upon the gender, depending upon the uh, physical activity, etc. And uh, muscles along with bones work together to produce movement. So you can see this person in a specific posture and uh, these uh, 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 movements are, are being produced by the musculoskeletal system uh, working uh, together. So when we think about the muscular tissue, immediately what comes to our mind is, uh, is the different types of this tissue. So let me tell you at this point that there are three main types of muscular tissue. One, uh, the first one is the skeletal muscle. This is the uh, muscle group of uh, tissues which has been represented over here in this figure. And these are the group of muscles. Uh, these are the group of tissues which produce movement along with the skeleton. But apart from the skeletal muscle, there are also the, the smooth muscle and uh, uh, there is also the cardiac muscle which is present in the heart. Now let us look at these uh, different tissues uh, in a little more detail. Uh, all of you know by now that uh, skeletal muscle is also called uh, striated muscle. Striated muscle because there are stria, the light and the dark bands can be seen on, on each of the muscle fibers, on each of the uh, muscle uh, uh, fibers. Uh, that you uh, that you see over here and uh, that is why uh, uh, skeletal muscle is also known as striated muscle uh, and uh, uh, you are also probably aware that uh, it is controlled by the uh, somatic nervous system that is which is under our consciousness so if we want to move the hand or we want to uh, put a uh, uh, put the hand in a uh, in some particular position then uh, this is these are the, uh, the the nervous system is actually the somatic nervous system is actually directing the con the contraction of the muscles in a, in a coordinated manner so uh, it is under our voluntary control but uh, when we look at the smooth muscle the name comes from the fact that there are no str striations in the smooth muscle fibers so uh, uh, where are they located uh, see this is the stomach so obviously the smooth muscle fibers are located in the stomach as well as the various abdominal uh, organs like the intestine, like the, uh, uh, like the urinary tract, uh, uh, 
uh, also it is uh, uh, the smooth muscle fibers are present in blood vessels uh, remember the uh, muscular arteries uh, which are uh, the radial ulnar arteries etc which are uh, trans uh, transporting blood to the peripheral peripheral tissues and uh, so these are uh, these blood vessels uh, the blood vessels uh, in the body uh, are lined by smooth uh, 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 smooth uh, muscle fibers and you also know about the respiratory tract uh, the respiratory tract is uh, you know, also uh, the respiratory uh, it is also having smooth muscle fibers in its wall and uh, it is the contraction of the smooth muscle fibers in this wall that produces the condition of asthma and uh, uh, so you have an idea that why these muscles are called smooth muscles and uh, and where are they present uh, then we come to the cardiac muscle and uh, cardiac muscle fibers are striated just like skeletal muscle fibers and uh, uh, but they are involuntary just like smooth muscle fibers uh, they are controlled by the aut autonomic nervous system the heart is controlled by the autonomic nervous system so both uh, both smooth and cardiac muscles uh, both smooth and cardiac muscles are uh, uh, are uh, involuntary muscles and they are controlled by the autonomic nervous system so uh, what are the functions of the muscular tissue uh, obviously the first and the most important function would be that they produce movements of the body so uh, whenever we uh, want to move our body uh, want to walk walk run etc then uh, this muscle tissue comes into action it maintains the posture many times we don't realize like i am sitting now so this this is a particular posture which is being maintained by the muscle tissue so uh, obviously it is cold now and you if you go out in the uh, uh, in the uh, outside without proper lens then uh, there will be shivering and uh, this shivering generates heat and the shivering is nothing but contraction of the muscle fibers so it also generates heat during cold weather and uh, uh, also uh, 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 storing and moving substances uh, within the body now storing and moving substances could be blood within the blood vessels it can be food within the uh, gut like the stomach or the intestines and uh, storing in the sense that uh, uh, I am sure all of you have heard in your biology classes about sphincter. Sphincter. What is a sphincter? Sphincter is a uh, is a muscle tissue which prevents the contents from escaping out, mm -hmm. and it uh, helps in the storage of the uh, food uh, within the stomach till it is properly uh, churned, uh, broken down into small particles, and mixed with the various enzymes. So, uh, storing and moving substances within the body, smooth muscle fibers within the stomach and the intestines to undergo peristalsis as a result of which the food, part, the food material is gradually moved uh, distally. So, these are the functions of the muscular tissue. Now, what are the properties of this muscular tissue? Uh, obviously, you have realized by now that the muscular tissue has the ability to contract, to shorten. But remember that muscular tissue is, has also the ability to stretch. You can stretch your muscles. You know about the uh, various exercises which uh, stretch the uh, muscle fibers. And uh, uh, you also, of those of you who are taking part in games, you will realize that there is a period before taking part in games called the warm-up period. In the warm-up period, the players undergo stretching exercises, so their muscles are appropriately tuned when they uh, go out to play the game. So, muscle fibers also have elasticity. If they are stretched or, uh, or they contract, they come back to their original position. And uh, uh, they also are excitable tissues. So, whenever muscle fibers are, uh, are going to contract, they generate a depolarization uh, and this de depolarization uh, causes the actin and my myosin filaments to uh, uh, to slide uh, uh, together and produce the contraction of the sarcomeres, uh, uh, which will uh, help, uh, which which produces the movement. So the 
uh, before the muscle contracts, it has to be excited. And this excite excitation may come from within the muscle tissue itself. Remember the heart where the ACE node is generating uh, impulses. Remember the GI tract, the urinary tract where there are muscle fibers which are generating uh, impulses. So this property of muscles is called autorhythmicity. They are able to control their contraction by themselves. Autorhythmicity. But remember that skeletal muscle fibers need to be excited by nerve by peripheral nerves coming out from the central nervous system whether uh, they are uh, cranial nerves or they are spinal nerves and uh, they are under our voluntary control so these are the properties of the muscular tissue so uh, muscular tissue uh, is made up of muscle cell but remember this muscle cell can also be called as a muscle fiber it can be also called as myocyte so these three terms are interchangeable. So uh, uh, students, let us look at the structure of the muscle. Now this is the uh, this is a uh, figure of a skeletal muscle. You can see that uh, this is one uh, uh, muscle fiber. This is one muscle fiber, and you can see that it has got multiple nuclei, which are pushed to the periphery. And the center part of the muscle fiber is occupied by fibrils. And fibrils, as you know, are, are made up of uh, actin and myosin filaments. Particular arrangement of the actin and myosin filaments produces this uh, striations. So, uh, 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 so these uh, muscle fibers, they, they are very large cells. And they can be as long as 30 or 40 centimeters in length. So they are a single cell. Uh, each muscle fiber is a single cell having hundreds of nuclei. And within the uh, muscle, uh, within this cell, muscle fiber or myocyte, uh, uh, there are fibrils. And each of these fibrils are made up of multiple actin and myosin filaments arranged in an orderly manner. So the the, cyto the plasma membrane of this uh, uh, of the muscle fiber is called sarcolemma and the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber is called sarcoplasm. The endoplasmic uh, reticulum, uh, you, you have surely read it in your school, in, uh, in your biology classes, the endoplasmic reticulum within the muscle fibers, this is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we will see there are various other things, various other modifications in the muscle fibers, which help it to produce movement. Now, uh, now uh, you can see over here uh, that uh, these muscle fibers are covered uh, on the outside by connective tissue. So the connective tissue which covers is each muscle fiber separately. This is called epimycium. So uh, this is called endomycium. Uh, please excuse my... Uh, uh, mistake the, the the connective tissue which con uh, covers each of these muscle fibers this is called endomycium so we have seen about skeletal muscle let, let us look at uh, at the smooth muscle now so uh, the smooth muscle you can see uh, these are made up of spindle shaped cells and uh, so you can see over here the middle part of the cell is broad but the ends of the cell are narrowed and tapering this is the nucleus and uh, they are arranged, uh, uh, you can see, in this, uh, 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 in this pattern. And uh, so the thick part of one muscle fiber is opposite the thin part of the another muscle fiber. So they are packed nicely and each of these is a muscle cell. Now what is the difference with the skeletal muscle fiber? Each muscle cell has only one nuclei. You can see the cent and the nuclei is placed centrally. You can see over here. Each muscle fiber, the each muscle, each of these is one muscle cell or myocyte or muscle fiber, and these are placed, and the nucleus is placed, single nucleus placed centrally. Now look at the cardiac muscle uh, over here. It is very much different from the other two types of muscle. You can see the striations. You can see the striations in the skeletal muscle. You can also see the striations in the cardiac muscle. But here the muscle cells are joined to each other by means of these transverse uh, structures 
these are called the intercalated discs you can see over here it is written intercalated disc so the each muscle cell is joined to another muscle cell and then another muscle cell by means of specific cell junctions called intercalated disc this term intercalated disc is very very important and is uh, 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 and is controlling the uh, the contraction of the cardiac of the heart muscles uh, in a very coordinated manner so uh, each of these is a muscle cell so if between two intercalated discs you, you can see over here this is one muscle cell and this cell may have one or two nuclei and you can also see that uh, one muscle fiber has it has here bifurcated into two and uh, so cardiac muscle fibers are uh, branching fibers also so uh, so compared to the skeletal muscle the cardiac muscle fibers and the smooth muscle fibers these are much smaller cells having uh, one nuclei for smooth muscle or one or two nuclei for the cardiac muscle and in both smooth and cardiac muscle the nucleus is present in the center so uh, let us now uh, put these three muscle types to get, uh, uh, side by side and see how they compare to each other so major features of the three types of muscle skeletal muscle cardiac muscle and smooth muscle now let us look at the skeletal muscle where is the location in relation to bones uh, uh, where where is the cardiac muscle present location heart where is the smooth muscle present i have already told you it is present in the respiratory tract uh, you can correlate it with asthma in the patients. Whenever patients suffer from asthma, it is due to the contraction of these smooth muscle fibers. And these muscle fibers are artificially relaxed by drugs so that the patient is able to smooth, uh, breathe freely. Uh, uh, where are other locations? Wall of hollow viscera, like the stomach, intestines, like the urinary bladder, ureter. It is also, do you know, smooth muscle is also present in the skin. There are specific muscle fibers in the skin known as arector pili muscle. So arector pili muscle actually when we get frightened or when we go out in the uh, very cold weather, the hair uh, on the body stand, uh, stand up and uh, this is called goose flesh. Go the goose flesh is due to the contraction of the arector pili muscle in the skin. Uh, students, do you know also that smooth muscle fibers are present in the iris of the eye and in the ciliary muscle. All of you know which part is the iris? The dark part uh, through, uh, uh, which you see through the cornea is the iris and this has uh, smooth muscle fibers within it. You also know that uh, our lens, the lenses in the eye, they, uh, they bulge out or they become narrow depending upon you are looking at a distance or you are looking uh, uh, close, you are reading a book. Uh, and uh, this is controlled by a uh, smooth muscle fiber called ciliary muscle. So, uh, uh, and also you know that uh, blood vessels uh, also have smooth muscle. So, you now know the location of each of these muscles. Let us look at the microscopic feature. Skeletal muscle fibers are long cylindrical fibers with many peripherally located nuclei. They are unbranched but they are striated. Now, what is the microscopic feature of cardiac muscle? They are branched cylindrical fibers with one centrally located nucleus. Uh, and when you look at the smooth muscle, microscopic feature, spindle shaped fibers, uh, spindle shaped fibers, these are cylindrical. This is cylindrical, but you see the sh uh, shape, spindle shaped fibers with one central nucleus. If you look at the diameter of the skeletal muscle, it is it can be very large. It can be between 10 to 100 microns in diameter. If you look at the diameter of the cardiac muscle fiber, it is uh, smaller than that. It is between 10 to 20 microns. And if you look at the diameter of the smooth muscle fibers, it is small. It is ranging between 3 to 8 microns. Do you know what is the uh, what is a micron? Micron is the unit of measurement in, in, in histology, in anatomy, particularly when we are looking at structures under the microscope. And it, refer, it measures uh, up to 10 to the power of minus 6 meters. So that is 1 micron. So uh, when we length, uh, look at the length of the mu skeletal muscle fibers, then they are very large. 
and they may measure from 100 microns to 30 centimeters or even 40 centimeters. Do you know which is the longest muscle in our body? Yes, you are right. It is the sartorius muscle. Uh, uh, when you look uh, at the length of the cardiac muscle, uh, it is varying between 50 to uh, 100 microns. And if you look at the uh, length of the smooth muscle, it is varying uh, between 30 to 200 microns. So both can be large, but the skeletal muscle fibers can be very, very large. Now let us look at the coverings of each of these three types of muscle. I have told you that these muscle fibers are covered by connective tissue. And in the skeletal muscle, I have told you that one of the coverings is endomycium. But if you would also, uh, I would also like to tell you that groups of skeletal muscle fibers are covered by thicker connective tissue, which is called perimysium. And the whole muscle is covered by connective tissue, which is called the epimysium. And uh, when you look at the uh, cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle has only the coverings of endomycium and perimysium. And when you look at the coverings of the smooth muscle, there is only endomycium in the smooth muscle. So, banding or striations, is it there in skeletal muscle? Yes. Is it there in cardiac muscle? Yes. But uh, uh, in banding in smooth muscle is not present. I have made a mistake in, in the typing over here. Uh, I would like to excuse myself for this mistake. The banding here, instead of yes, you just mention uh, right here, no. So banding is not there in smooth muscle. That is why it is known as the smooth muscle. So uh, then uh, between skeletal muscle fibers, are there junctions? There are no specialized junctions. In the cardiac muscle, are there junctions? Yes, there are junctions. And these junctions are known as intercalated discs. Intercalated discs contain uh, desmosomes and gap junctions and fascia adherence. Uh, you remember I had talked about uh, the cell junctions in my last lecture and I had particularly mentioned about the desmosomes. These are very important for holding cells together. So, and uh, you, if you look at a structure of a desmosome, this is one cell membrane, this is another cell membrane. And on the side of the cell membrane, towards the cytoplasmic side, there is plaque. There is a thickening over here, which is known as plaque. And on this plaque, uh, on this plaque, uh, there are uh, actin filaments, which are getting inserted uh, from the cytoplasmic side. And the two plaques are held together across the gap between the two cells by specific uh, 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 structures called cadherins, filamentous structures called cadherins. So uh, desmosomes and gap junctions are actually uh, communication, communicating channels between cells. So if one cardiac muscle fiber is excited, it will pass on the excitation to other cardiac muscle fibers through these gap junctions, which are pres present at the region of the intercalated discs. Now, if you look at the uh, junctions between the smooth muscle fibers, then you will see that uh, they also have gap junctions, but they don't have these uh, intercalated discs or desmosomes. So they are also able to contract together by uh, transmitting excitation from one fiber to the other. So uh, transverse tubules are very important. Transverse tubules are actually uh, invaginations of the cell membrane uh, going uh, inside the cytoplasm. So, uh, so there are uh, numerous uh, trans uh, invaginations of the sarcolemma into the sarcoplasm. Uh, and what is the purpose of this? The excitation from the surface of the muscle fiber is transmitted to the inside of the muscle fiber. So, these are called transverse tubules. They are very important in the uh, for the contraction of the skeletal muscle fibers. Now, transverse tubules, are they present in the cardiac muscle? Yes, they are present. But are they present in the smooth muscle? Just like the banding, which I said it is not present, transverse tubules also are not present in the smooth muscle fiber. And you must also remember that cardiac muscle and smooth muscle have the property of autorhythmicity. They are able to generate electrical impulses and stimulate themselves and the neighboring cells. 
So uh, intercalated discs, discs are actually a combination of three structures. What are these three structures? One is the desmosome, the other is the gap junction, and the third is the fascia adherence. I had talked to you about uh, uh, zonula adherence in my last lecture. Uh, it is going like a belt around the cell. But if the uh, fascia adherence is restricted, is, uh, is restricted to uh, a, only a small part of the cell, cell periphery, then it is called fascia adherence. So if I, if I ask you what are the components of the intercalated disc, which are only seen in the cardiac muscle fibers, then your answers would be one, the desmosome, desmosome, two, the gap junctions, and three, the fascia, the fascia adherence. So let us look at the uh, arrangement of the skeletal muscle fibers. So if you see over here, this is one skeletal muscle fiber, one skeletal muscle fiber, and uh, you can see the sarcolemma over here, and uh, covered by connective tissue, which is known as the endomycium over here. And within the uh, cell cytoplasm, you can see the nuclei at the periphery. And the center, these are mitochondria. And within the uh, majority portion of the cell is occupied by myofibrils. Now, if you take out one myofibril uh, from this, so here uh, one muscle fiber has been again cut out. And the myofibril, has one of these um, uh, bundles have been taken out. You can see they are, com they are composed of alternate light and dark bands. And they are composed of uh, actin and myosin filaments. Now, these mu each individual muscle fibers uh, are packed together uh, to form uh, fascicles. And the fascicles are covered by uh, the uh, perimysium. You can see the perimysium over here. And further out, further out, uh, these fascicles are now bundled together into one muscle, into one muscle by epimysium. See the epimysium over here. Now, which is this muscle? This is the humerus. The humerus, you know, is here. And this is the biceps brachii muscle. The biceps brachii muscle is present in the front of the arm. And uh, uh, this muscle is, uh, is uh, can be seen over here. And if you break down this muscle, you will uh, progressively see how the uh, uh, muscle is, what is the, what are the various uh, subdivisions or what are the muscle made up of, what is the muscle made up of in a, at a progressively uh, smaller level. So here you can again see one muscle fiber and you can see uh, the myofibrils, each of it is at this, is a myofibril. So if I ask you what is the unit of a skeletal muscle fiber. So one unit of a skeletal muscle fiber would be like one con a contractile unit of a skeletal muscle fiber would be uh, one myofibril. And there are multiple myofibrils made up of each of which is made up of actin and myosin filaments packed together within the sarcolemma. And in between will be the sarcoplasm. So uh, now you see students that uh, uh, I have told you about the light and the dark bands. So you can see over here uh, that uh, uh, the dark band corresponds with the myosin filament. So myosin filament is present. This is one sarcomere, one, one unit. If you look at uh, one unit of a skeletal, uh, there are various ways at which, with which, uh, by which you can understand the, uh, the skeletal muscle fiber. Uh, if you are looking at uh, uh, the morphological unit, uh, then the, each of these units are called a sarcomere. But if you are looking at the uh, at the individual uh, components which are contracting uh, within a muscle fiber, then uh, the answer would be the myofibrils. So, uh, so uh, I will uh, revise. What I, what I will slightly revise what I told you. If I ask you what is the unit of a skeletal muscle fiber, your answer should be sarco sarcomere unless I specify that what is the, uh, what is the exact contractile mechanism, uh, unitary contractile mechanism by which a muscle fiber contracts. Uh, so here in one sarcomere, you can see the center part is occupied by the myosin filaments. 
and the periphery is occupied by the actin filaments which are actually interdigitating in this manner. So when the muscle fiber contracts, this uh, actin and myosin filaments slide within each other, slide within each other to produce a narrower sarcomere. So you see this is the normal resting sarcomere. Now they have moved into each other and this is known as the sliding filament theory. Previously, uh, before 1950s, uh, that is almost 70 years back, people thought that uh, contraction is being produced by the buckling of these uh, filaments. Say they, the actin and myosin filaments, they are actually, when they, they buckle like this, but, uh, but now we know that they don't buckle until at the extreme point, usually they are only sliding into each other uh, in this manner. And uh, that is, uh, and this came to be known after the uh, invention of the electron microscope. And this is known as the sliding filament theory. So here, uh, uh, if you look, uh, this, the entire extent of the myosin filament would be the uh, dark band. And uh, 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 this part of the, uh, uh, containing the actin filament and the other part containing the actin filament of the other sarcomere will be the light band and uh, in between the light band there is a jet jet disc and in between the uh, in between the in the middle of the dark band there is a uh, uh, there is a m line there is an m line uh, m actually means middle so it will actually it is in the middle of the dark band so it is known also known as the m line and uh, uh, when the when the sarcomere contracts you can see that the z the z discs uh, or z, z line come closer to each other uh, uh, but the dark band but the dark band remains of the same thickness the light bands also shrink but the dark band remains of the same thickness. So this is the mechanism of contraction of the skeletal muscle fibers. So uh, this is an electron. I just told you about the electron microscope and you know that our department has a separate facility for electron microscope. So if you put the skeletal muscle fiber under an electron microscope, then what would you see? Now uh, this is the uh, uh, this is a uh, skeletal muscle fiber and you can see the uh, 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 these are the invaginations from the surface of one. This is one muscle fiber. This is another muscle fiber. This is the place occupied by connective tissue called endomysium. So from the surface of the uh, muscle fiber, you can see these invaginations going into the uh, skeletal muscle fiber which are known as the transverse tubules. These are known as the transverse tubules. So, uh, uh, and further on, when you look at these transverse tubules, you will see that on the sides of them, on the side of the transverse tubules, you can see the Z, Z disc over here, and you can see the dark band over here, and the A and the I bands. Uh, A is the dark band, I is the light band. You will see that uh, by the side of each of these transverse tubules, which are nothing but invaginations of the sarcolemma inside the muscle fiber, on each side there are uh, uh, terminal cisterns. There are, there are two terminal cisterns and these are nothing but extensions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if I put this in a figurative manner over here, then in the center are these transverse tubules bounded on both sides by these terminal cisterns, which are nothing but extensions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when, uh, when there is a uh, depolarization of the skeletal muscle fibers, the depolarization uh, moves into the muscle fiber through these transverse tubules and it excites the terminal cistern from where calcium is released. So once calcium is released, once calcium is released, this calcium activates the mechanism of contraction of the muscle fiber as a result of which the actin moves within the myosin filaments through the sliding filament theory. So here we have uh, three structures side by side within a skeletal mu muscle uh, at regular intervals, skeletal muscle fiber within regular intervals, which is made up of 
uh, which is also known as a triad. So three structures. Triad means there are there are three structures, and these three structures together must make make up the muscle triad. Now this triad is not so well developed in the cardiac muscle, and it is not present at all. It is not present at all in the skeletal in the smooth muscle. So remember, this triad is a very very definitive uh, uh, feature of the skeletal muscle fibers. So uh, you have just uh, heard about the skeletal muscle fibers. Let us look at the uh, different types of skeletal muscle fibers. So I will just take you further and come back to this slide later. Uh, here, if you take the skeletal a section of the skeletal muscle fiber and put it under the microscope, you will see that certain fibers are dark in color. Certain fibers are absolutely light in color, uh, light in color like this white and certain fibers are intermediate in color. See, they are gray in color. Accordingly, we, these dark fibers, cross sections of which are dark, these are type 1 fibers. The, the absolute white ones are type 2B fibers and the intermediate ones, the gray ones, are the type 2A fibers. These fibers are very, very important from the uh, from the sports medicine point of view uh, and uh, let me tell you why this uh, the cross section of these skeletal uh, muscle fibers are appearing like this now this dark uh, fibers actually uh, it has been stained with a dye but if you look at the skeletal muscle fiber uh, in a cross section uh, you will see that uh, 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 some of them are dark red in color. Uh, the type 1 fibers, which are also known as the slow oxidative fibers, they are dark red in color. And what is the reason for this dark color? They have a lot of a uh, oxygen binding uh, uh, chemical called myoglobin. And they also are very rich uh, in capillaries. Uh, capillaries are also present around them. So they are also having a lot of capillaries around them. So because of which they appear dark red in color. This is, this is when you are, you have cut a muscle, say you have cut the, you have a section of a rat, muscle uh, five, uh, muscle of a rat, and you are, ju you are just uh, seeing it uh, under the light. And uh, you will see there are some fibers which are dark red in color, some fibers which are red pink in color, and some fibers which are appearing white in color. So uh, the dark red in color is you you know now why they are dark red because of this pigment called myoglobin and capillaries they contain many mitochondria they are they have uh, they can continuously contract over long periods they are resistant to fatigue and uh, they uh, break down aerobic fatty acids by aerobic uh, aerobic mechanism now in short these type one fibers are also called SO fibers SO fibers means they contract slowly. The, the ATPase, the myosin ATPase, which is present at the head of the myosin filaments, it breaks down ATP very slowly. So the muscle contracts very slowly. But uh, it can contract for long periods of time. So uh, you can understand that uh, the muscle of, our, of the back of the leg, the muscle of our back, the muscle, some of the muscle fibers in the legs are, uh, are of this type as they help in maintaining the posture. Now, uh, coming to the fast type 2B or fast white glycolytic fibers, uh, uh, they are also known as FG fibers, fast glycolytic. Uh, they have no myoglobin and capillaries. They appear, because of which they appear white in color. They have large stores of glycogen, which they break down by an anaerobic mechanism. And they can take part in intense activity of short durations, but this fatigue quickly. That the muscles of the, our hand, uh, you will see that if you are typing on the keyboard, after some time your fingers feel very fatigued. You are not able to type properly. Uh, so this is uh, the 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 muscles of the hand, particularly, are of this type, FG type, and. Uh, 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 they, they produce activity for short periods of time. So in athletes uh, who are uh, taking part in 100 meters race or steeple chase, or uh, they, they, are, they would be very well developed. 
So now let us look at the intermediate fibers. These are called type 2A fast intermediate oxidative glycolytic fibers. So it is both having properties of both the type 1 fiber and the type 2B fiber. So uh, they are called FOG fibers, F-O-G, F stands for fast, O stands for oxidative and the G stands for glyco glycolytic or glycolytic uh, word. So these FOG fibers, they are red pink in color. They are red pink in color due to lesser myoglobin and capillaries. They also have many mitochondria like the type 1 fibers. They break down uh, aerobic uh, breakdown of fatty acids as well as anaerobic breakdown of glucose. So they are faster than slow fibers and they are used for uh, routine, our routine activities like walking, running, swimming, etc. And uh, uh, so, uh, and even you can think that those who are, uh, uh, who are uh, uh, running uh, the long distance race like the ma marathon runners, they will, more, they will have more of this and this type of fibers, this type of fibers, than this type of fiber. These fibers will be more in people who are doing uh, short intense periods of activity like playing some games like basketball, cricket, etc. Throwing the cricket ball, they can be also... Uh, in people who are throwing weights, uh, the short put, etc., these type of fibers will be uh, more in them. So you can understand that, that depending upon our physical activity, these fiber types may change among themselves. Particularly, you see this arrow. These two types, type 2A and type, type B, 2B, can ex interchange among themselves. So when our activity, intense activity, short duration activity is more, there will be more of these type of fibers. When long duration activity is more, uh, then this type of fibers will be more compared to this. Now, uh, so there are these three types of fibers. Now, most of you would be thinking, okay, in a normal human being, which type of fibers are more? But the answer would be the type 1 fibers comprise almost 50% of the typical skeletal muscle. So maximum number of fibers in any muscle in our body would be the type 1 SO fibers and not the FOG or the FG fibers. I hope you understand this, uh, the importance of this. Now, muscle, skeletal muscle fibers are uh, under our voluntary control and they are, uh, and they contract, and they contract when, when there is uh, uh, activation coming from the, along the nerves. So wherever the nerves end on the uh, muscle fibers, this is called a neuromuscular junction uh, or a motor end plate. Uh, 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 there are some, there is some difference in opinion over here where another uh, theory, uh, another take, other textbooks say, other authors say that the motor end plate is only this part of the uh, uh, neuromuscular ju junction, while this part is called the synaptic folds. Synaptic folds. Now, uh, anatomically or Majority of the authors, of course, say that the entire uh, structural modification where a skeletal nerve fiber, where a, where a somatic nerve fibers goes to innervate a skeletal muscle fiber is known as a neuromuscular junction or motor end plate. So you can see over here how this, this is an EM picture. You can see how the nerve fibers are dividing to supply each muscle fiber. And now if you take a section, if you take a section of this motor end plate, then what you see? You see that this is a myelinated nerve fiber uh, and at towards the end, the myelin stops. Instead, it is it is just covered by the Schwann cell cytoplasm. This is the ex expanded part. This is known as the uh, presynaptic terminal, presynaptic uh, terminal. And it co uh, contains uh, numerous synaptic vesicles uh, which has acetylcholine within it and on the muscle fiber you will see uh, there, is, there are various irregularities like this. These are called junctional folds and here are millions and millions of receptors, acetylcholine, uh, acetylcholine receptors. So these, synap these uh, synaptic uh, vesicles contain uh, acetylcholine which when this nerve fiber is excited it, the acetylcholine is released into the into this synaptic cleft and it tra 
uh, it uh, diffuses and binds to the acetylcholine receptors which are present in this and these acetylcholine receptors then uh, produce depolarization of the muscle fiber which then contracts. So all of you must know what are the components of the neuromuscular junction and I will just put out the steps of muscle depolarization. First is release, once the activity comes, there is release of acetylcholine from the vesicles, activation of the acetylcholine receptors on the junctional folds, then there is depolarization of the muscle, release of calcium from terminal cisterns, and then contraction of the muscle fibers, and then uh, with time, there is breaking down of this acetylcholine by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, uh, so that uh, the muscle can relax after some time. Uh, so, you see that some of these have been highlighted in red, in uh, blue and in purple. What is the reason for this? So, uh, I will tell you the reason for this. Now, release of, release of acetylcholine can be, uh, can be stopped by, ad, uh, by the ingestion of a, of a very, very powerful toxin known to mankind called botulinum toxin. Now, I don't know whether you have heard about Botox injections. This is one of the most powerful toxins known to mankind. And you know, these uh, when meat is or meat is canned in Western countries, uh, most of the food materials that they take are canned or sealed in cans. So when it is not properly sealed, then there is bacteria within the meat, which produces a very powerful toxin called botulinum toxin. This toxin, when ingested, it stops the release of acetylcholine from these uh, synaptic vesicles. So the person dies of paralysis, of respiratory paralysis. Uh, but you know now that botox is also given uh, uh, as injections when there is blepharospasm or when there is stabismus, uh, when there are wrinkles on the face. So uh, people are using uh, also the bot botox for therapeutic purpose. Now, these acetylcholine receptors are activated and these acetylcholine receptors uh, are affected in a disease called myasthenia gravis. So, there are, it is an autoimmune disease uh, whereby the receptors are damaged progressively and uh, the muscle is not able to contract. So, uh, artificially, uh, uh, some drugs are given uh, which are able to, uh, which are uh, which are able to bind to this, uh, 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 which are able to bind to the acetylcholine receptors and produce the contraction of the muscle. Now, breaking down of acetylcholine by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. So, uh, uh, so if uh, uh, breaking down of enzyme acetylcholine esterase. So, if the acetylcholine esterase, which is an enzyme present over here, it is naturally breaking down the acetylcholine it is deactivated some by some poison, then the muscle will be in a continuous state of contraction for a long period of time. So then you have to give a drug which will block the acetylcholine receptors. So these are uh, various uh, treatment modalities for poisoning. Remember, remember this neuromuscular junction is a very, very important site uh, during surgery also where uh, artificially these neuromuscular junctions are blocked for the relaxation of the muscles so that the surgeon is able to uh, perform the operation nicely and at the end of the surgery the uh, a drug is given to reverse the effect of the previous drug so that uh, uh, the patient uh, becomes conscious mm -hmm. so smooth muscle relaxing agents if you have attended any surg surgeries you will see the anesthetist yeah, administrating smooth muscle, relax, uh, skeletal muscle relaxing agents to the patients before surgery. So, uh, so uh, please uh, practice drawing the diagrams. Now, uh, if there is a mechanism for contracting muscle, contraction of muscles, there is also a mechanism to prevent excessive stretching of muscles. And this forms the basis of a very important clinical test. Now you see there are a specific type of uh, structures present within skeletal muscle fibers called uh, muscle spindles. Muscle spindles actually uh, they sense the stretching of the muscle. When if the muscle is stretched too much, if, if the muscle is stretched too much, then 
it may tear. So nature doesn't want the muscle to tear. So it will prevent the tearing by inhibiting the uh, stretching of the muscle, making make the muscle contract. And this uh, this is called the stretch reflex. It occurs automatically, and this stretch reflex is used for evaluating the nervous system, the the functions of the nervous system by means of knee jerk, ankle jerk, biceps jerk, triceps jerk. You can see this hammer, which is used to uh, elicit the stretch reflex, which is mediated by these muscle spindles. Do you know also that excessive contraction of the muscle can uh, result in its damage? So there are again another type of structure present in the tendons which prevents excessive contraction of the muscle. So nature has given mechanism to prevent excessive stretching of the muscle and excessive contraction of the muscle too. So the, the function is optimum. And what is the uh, organ system uh, structure responsible for preventing excessive contraction? It is known as the Golgi tendon organ and you have heard correctly it is present within the tendons of these muscles. So here will be the Golgi tendon organ which is preventing unnecessary and excessive contraction of the muscle fibers. So coming to the cardiac muscle fibers, the cardiac as I have mentioned they are branching fibers, there is a central nucleus. So uh, what are the features? Cardiac fibers contain 1 to 2 nuclei and branch to interconnect with other fibers, nuclei are central in position, dark staining transverse bands that cross the chains of cardiac uh, cells at regular intervals. So there are uh, there are uh, striations in the cardiac muscle also. You can see these striations. T tubules, uh, T tubules are more extensive in cardiac muscle. Uh, T tubules are more extensive, but terminal cisterns are less well developed. So I like to modify what I told you before. T tubules are well developed in cardiac muscle, but what is not well developed are the terminal cisterns. Previously, I told you T tubules are not well developed in cardiac muscle and uh, smooth, and they are absent in the smooth muscle. I would like to change it. I'd like to change it and correct myself and tell you that T, T tubules are more extensive in cardiac muscle, but I was referring actually to the terminal cisterns, which are less well developed in the cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle has numerous mitochondria within them to provide energy to them and uh, the major fuel for, for the heart are the fatty acids which are brought to it by the uh, through the mechanism of uh, lipoproteins. So what about the smooth muscle? Remember they are spindle shaped cells and uh, they are smooth muscle fibers are elongated tapering and non striated muscles connected by means of gap junctions. So the muscle fibers communicate by gap junctions. Each of the muscle fiber is covered by a basal lamina. Uh, similarly for the skeletal muscle fiber and uh, there is a single nucleus in the center. T tubules are not present. Actin and myosin filaments crisscross obliquely throughout the cell not arranged regularly. So there is no striations in smooth muscle. That is why the name. So these actin and uh, actin filaments along with uh, uh, they get inserted on specific cytoplasmic plaques, uh, plaques which are called dense bodies. So where are, what are dense bodies? Dense bodies are thickening of the cytoplasm to which the uh, these actin filaments uh, 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 and other types of filaments, uh, 10 nanometer diameter intermediate filaments called desmin and vinculin insert. So remember specifically about dense bodies present in smooth muscles. Actin filaments also insert into these dense bodies and neuromuscular junction are not, are not present. So you can see over here that the, these are autonomic nerve fibers and these autonomic nerve fibers have uh, dilatations in between having synaptic vesicles which are released and these go and diffuse to the smooth muscle fibers and produce contraction in a number of muscle fibers. Uh, there is no one to one innervation of a smooth muscle fiber with one with what? with one nerve fiber. So uh, uh, you can see the, now the spindle shape fiber, uh, muscle fibers and you can see the dense bodies present within the uh, cytoplasm of these smooth muscle fibers and uh, uh, you can see the dense bodies better over here and uh, uh, the dense bodies can also uh, 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 help in uh, attaching the other smooth muscle cells to it. So the, uh, the cells do not come apart when they are contracting. 
so this was about skeletal muscle students it is very important that you learn about the uh, not only skeletal muscle about the muscular tissue remember uh, i give you a uh, uh, i give you one uh, work to find out that uh, exercise uh, here that uh, after heart attack the it, there is estimation of troponin uh, uh, and tropomycin in the blood uh, uh, level of troponin and tropomycin, uh, tropomycin is uh, estimated in the blood after a mark myocardial uh, uh, after a heart attack or myocardial uh, infarction so why do they estimate the troponin tropomycin you can uh, read it from your book and try to understand it now i have very little time now and uh, in this uh, short 5 minutes time i will cover i try to cover as much of the nervous system as possible now students i told you about the nervous system i told you that there is a central nervous system there is a peripheral nervous system let us look at the central nervous system is only two part the brain and the spinal cord and the brain uh, has again uh, the cerebrum the cerebellum the uh, brain stem and uh, what is uh, hidden over here uh is the uh, is the diencephalon containing thalamus hypothalamus etc so uh so uh, these are the different parts of the brain and uh, this brain uh, uh this cere the cerebrum and the cerebellum are having sulci you can see these grooves etc and gyri on the surface and uh, the cerebrum has this and the cerebellum has uh, smaller gyri and sulci these are called folia and fissures so these are large these are called sulci and gyri and in the cerebellum the same things are developed to a much smaller extent so we differentiate them and their names are changed we call them folia and fissures folia remember uh, you have read about it it means leaf like structure the cerebrum can be uh, divided the cerebral hemisphere can be divided into four lobes i have told them about them earlier and i have also told you about the functions do you remember students what is the function of occipital lobe it is vision uh, what is the function of temporal lobe remember it is memory it is the recognition of faces uh, and it is also responsible for the uh, sense of hearing now the uh, the two cerebral hemispheres communicate by means of a midline band of white matter uh nerve fibers uh, which is, which is in the form of this arc it is known as corpus callosum and uh, you also see that the inner aspect of the brain uh, is hollow and this hollow part is known as the ventricles and it is filled up with csf this is the part of the brain stem this is the midbrain pons and medulla oblongata and you can see the uh, you can see the various cranial nerves which are coming out do you know how many cranial nerves are there there is yes, you are right there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves out of which the first two are attached to the cerebrum the remaining nine, uh, the remaining 10 are attached to the brain stem starting with the third cranial nerve which is also known as the oculomotor nerve attached to the front of the midbrain so like this there are so many cranial nerves you can read them in your textbook and uh, this is the actual specimen of the brain and you can see uh, how the brain looks like and this is the site of the attachment of the pituitary gland this is the hypothalamus which you have read about uh, very extensively in your biology classes uh, and uh, this is the brain stem with the cranial nerves coming this is the cerebellum and this is the cerebrum so uh, 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 the what has happened is that within the uh, brain there is a cavity as i mentioned ventricles which is filled up with csf csf is produced by a specific uh, by specific structures called choroid plexus and there are openings uh, on the wall of the central of the brain through which the csf comes out and it is now in covering up the whole brain so you can see the csf it has come out of the brain and now it is covering up the whole brain and as if uh, the brain is floating in a bath tub of csf and uh, further on this csf is absorbed into uh, uh structures uh, which are called arachnoid granulations so uh, uh arachnoid villi so these are absorbed into the blood venous uh, blood through specific uh, arachnoid villi and arachnoid granulations so uh, uh 
So CSF is both inside the brain and outside the brain. And which is the channel through which the CSF comes out of the brain? It is known as the uh, uh, median aperture of Magendi and foramen of Lashka. So there are three, ap three uh, apertures on, in the brain stem. Uh, one central aperture is the median aperture of Magendi and two lateral apertures called foramen of Lashka through which the CSF comes out. So in this, this is the actual human brain. You can see over here that on the surface of the cerebrum, uh, it is the, the, the brain matter is dark in color as compared to the center of the cerebrum where the brain matter is white in color. This outside layer is the gray matter and the inside layer is the white matter. So the neurons, the nerve cells are present in the gray matter. So if uh, often we say that if some, some person are, is very intelligent, then we say that he has he or she has a lot of gray matter. And white matter is actually only composed of nerve fibers. So what are the coverings of the brain? You see there is a dura matter over here. Then there is a uh, uh, there is an arachnoid matter. This green one is the arachnoid matter. This uh, uh, one is the dura matter, then this is the arachnoid matter, and the one on the surface of the brain is the pia matter. Uh, so in between the pia and the arachnoid, there is a cavity, and this cavity is filled up with CSF. Uh, uh, there is a space, not cavity, and the space is filled up with CSF. And you can see there are arachnoid villi, uh, which are extensions of this space into the, uh, into the venous uh, sinuses, uh, through which the CSF escapes into the blood. So you may just read in brief about the circulation of the CSF, how it is being produced by the from the choroid plexus and it is being absorbed back into the blood uh, 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 through the arachnoid villi. So I stop over here uh, because I think I have already exceeded my time and uh, 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 I have uh, given you my email address. Uh, I don't know whether you have any WhatsApp group or not. So if you, uh, uh, my email address is sbr underscore aiims at hotmail.com. If you have some very burning questions or pressing questions, you can uh, email it to me at this, or you can create a WhatsApp group and uh, through your teacher and you can include me just like the NDBS batch. And if you have some queries in, within, uh, within this part, then you can. Uh, you can ask me and I will be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you very much. Ninety-seven. Concurrent